So tonight's speaker, Homer Thiel, is the man who probably knows the most uh, about the Mexican and Hispanic uh, periods uh, archaeologically here in the Tucson area. He came to desert archaeology in 1992, and he's been working on a variety, a wide variety of urban archaeological projects here in, in Tucson. He's also worked up in Phoenix, so he has that uh, balanced perspective of north and south. But uh, for tonight, I'm just going to turn you over to Homer Thiel to tell his uh, perspective on the Spanish and colonial periods here in Tucson. All right, my talk is on the life on the northern frontier of the Pima Maria Alta. Um, the Pima Maria Alta is the area of southern Arizona, northern Sonora, and it's the area that I've specialized in since 1992. This is a photograph of the mural at the Presidio San Agustin del Tucson Park that's downtown. It's the, on the block north of the Pima County Courthouse. And I'll give a little plug. I'm the president of the Tucson Presidio Trust. So in 1775, an Irishman named Hugo O'Connor was employed by the Spanish military to inspect all of the Presidio fortresses from Louisiana to California. And when he got to Tubac, he decided that the Tubac Presidio was in a uh, not a very good place. It was the, the Presidio itself was poorly designed. There was a, an armed captain's house with a number of buildings around it that were not enclosed within a wall. Um, the Apache were busy going down into uh, southern Arizona and Sonora for uh, visits. And of course, for the Spaniards, they were making trouble. So he came up north to uh, Tucson and decided that that was a better location for a Presidio. Um, in the years since 1992, when I've been doing research, uh, there's been two sort of facets of my research. One is looking at archival sources, uh, both looking at ones that have been previously found and finding new ones. We have uh, a, not a huge number of records from the Tucson Presidio because when the soldiers left in 1856, uh, they were going down to Imuris in Mexico. And the story is that the, some of the soldiers tore up the record books to make cigarettes. Um, luckily, there are some surviving records, like this is the 1797 uh, census, and at that time there were 395 people living inside the Presidio, and probably another 500 to 600 Native Americans living around it. So the total population of Tucson, say around 1800, was maybe a thousand people, and you consider now there's somewhere between 750,000 and a million living in the area. Starting in 1992, I began doing archaeological research. The first thing was to see if we could locate portions of the Tucson Presidio. And the first dig I did was in the Pima County Courthouse courtyard. And underneath the central sidewalk, we found the east wall of the Presidio. And in one area, it turned a corner, and we knew that there was a gate on the east side. In 1998 and 1999, we did additional digs uh, through the Center for Desert Archaeology. And uh, here you can see Bill examining soil layers in the lawn uh, east, no, west of the city hall. And the thing running down the middle there is the Presidio wall with the Presidio blacksmith shop on the uh, left side. Starting in 2000, we began work in the corner parking lot at Church and Washington Street. And one of the things that we first did was we were allowed to dig 13 parking spaces and we were checking to see if there were enough remnants of the Presidio there for a park to be built as part of the sort of ill-fated Rio Nuevo project. And uh, one of the things that we found, uh, we uh, uncovered uh, a pit house that had been excavated in 1954 by the University of Arizona. And on that first day of the dig, one of the crew members said to me, are we going to find a time capsule? And I said, no, we're not going to find a time capsule. No one finds a time capsule. And an hour later, he found a time capsule. <laughs> and I called up Bill, and I said, we found a time capsule. And he goes, oh, that's interesting. And I said, no, maybe you should call the, like, the mayor's office. And then he called me back uh, an hour later, maybe panicked. Like, you didn't open it up, did you? And I'm like, no, I waited. And so the mayor came two days later and opened it up, and there was a note from a 
guy that had funded or organized the dig in 1954 saying, whomever finds this, I hope you appreciate this historic site. And that was a great thing to do. We found enough of the Presidio there that we could rebuild that corner on its uh, sort of original location. So what have we found out in the 25 and a half years of research? We found out uh, where portions of the fort were. We found out what the people living in the Presidio had in terms of their uh, things that they had in their house. We were able to establish the degree of trade with Native Americans. We were able to find out what they were eating. Uh, we found out what was really important for them in terms of their cultural traditions. And we found out ties with uh, modern families. Is there anyone here that has an ancestor from the Tucson Presidio? Yes, Rachel has an ancestor who was a soldier here. And uh, there's a group called the Sendientes here in town where um, hundreds of people that have uh, ancestors that live in the fort are members. Uh, a quick map um, to show some things that will be talked about. There's the Tucson Presidio. On the San Pedro River, there was the Terranate Presidio, which was established at the same time as Tucson, but only lasted five years because of the uh, Apache visited that fort very often, and eventually about 90 of the soldiers had died, including two of the fort commanders. So they gave up and went back to uh, Sonora. Um, Emiris and Arizpe were the two places where the soldiers uh, would go down for the monthly payroll to buy goods and get their paychecks, basically. And those are about more than 100 miles south of here. And Wymus uh, is important later on. So first of all, let's talk about the Presidio Blacksmith Shop. We found it in the lawn of City Hall. We uncovered a relatively small portion of it, but inside we found a, the, one of the hearths where they were busy working on metal artifacts. We don't actually find very many metal items in, in our digs because metal was such a precious thing up here that if you broke something, uh, part of your gun, you'd hand the metal over to the Presidio blacksmith and he would do something with it. One of our Presidio Trust members is a descendant of one of the uh, blacksmiths. Well, what made this blacksmith's shop special was that it had a meteorite anvil. In the 1820s, a group of people were down in the Santa Rita Mountains, uh, probably uh, getting uh, wood to, for beams for their houses, and they found two enormous uh, uh, meteorites. One of them, this is the, called the ring meteorite, uh, was taken out and was put in front of the blacksmith shop uh, somewhere in the city hall lawn area. And in 1846, the Mormon battalion came through and a lot of them were busy uh, writing material down for guidebooks and they all wrote down, "There's this, these blacksmiths are using two anvils made out of meteorites. And within a couple of years, a German uh, uh, scientific journals were talking about them. Well, in 1862, the Union Army reoccupied Tucson, taking it back from the Confederates who had uh, uh, gained control the previous year. And the General uh, Carlton, who was in charge, knew about the meteorites. And the first thing he did was pack them up on wagons and send them to Wymus. And the uh, first thing they did then was to ship them up to San Francisco. And here's the ring meteorite on the steps of the, like the San Francisco Academy of Science. And uh, then they put this one on a, a ship, sent it down to Panama. They dragged it across the Isthmus of Panama and shipped it up to the Smithsonian. And then the second uh, meteorite was, once they got the Transcontinental Railroad uh, done, was shipped across to uh, the Smithsonian. And when you go to the Hope Diamond Room, you know, the famous Hope Diamond, you turn around and there are the Tucson meteorites on display uh, right behind it. So on the floor of the uh, Presidio Blacksmith Shop, we found four prehistoric groundstone tools. And that was kind of surprising. There was a three-quarter grooved ax, a couple of monos, and a nether stone. When uh, we handed them over to our groundstone analyst, Jenny Adams, we didn't tell her anything about them. And she came in and told me, well, there's copper pounded on the surface of one of these groundstone tools. And so the uh, blacksmiths were out collecting pieces of groundstone and using them in their shop as an, as an example of sort of extreme recycling. Well, uh, you know, finding uh, meteorites is great for anvils, but that isn't uh, the only thing that people in the uh, Presidio needed. And luckily, the local Odom, or the Papagoys they were known back then, were more than willing to trade with the residents of the Presidio for items. Uh, uh, so they would bring fodder, hay, straw in, firewood. Uh, they would help out with building materials. They would uh, 
give labor to help make the adobe bricks for the fort and the houses inside. They would provide information. There were a group of Apache that settled next to the fort in 1792, and if they heard rumors that their relatives were coming to attack the fort, they would go and tattletale on them. Uh, they also brought in wild, uh, some wild game, not a lot, but deer uh, and other uh, wild animals, and things like saguaro, a fruit, and they uh, uh, brought a lot of pottery. This is a, a territorial period picture showing an Oadam woman with her burden basket loaded up with Oyas. Here's a, a, a Casas painting from Mexico. Uh, these were paintings created to uh, show people what the appropriate uh, caste was for people based on their racial characteristics. The uh, Spanish down in the Mexico City area were very interested in uh, sort of segregating people by if they had one half Spanish, one half Arab, one half African, that sort of thing. And these paintings are great because they show what's in the house. And there on the Comal uh, stovetop, uh, you can see a, uh, uh, an olla being used, or a, a jar for cooking. And here's a similar one uh, made by the Sabaipari Pima that we found at the Presidio site. And you can tell that it was used for cooking because uh, it has sooting on the exterior. And on the interior, there's scrape marks from when they were using a dipper to dip out uh, the food. The Spanish here in Tucson were eating a lot of soups and stews. Easy to make. You put some water in, throw whatever uh, meat you had, whatever vegetables if you had any, and just put it next to the stove to keep warm. The, one of the things that they ate every day was tortillas. Here we have a postcard showing a woman using a metal tortilla a griddle. Unfortunately for the people in, in Tucson Presidio, metal, of course, was very difficult to get. The nearest store was 100 miles away. These tortilla griddles were very expensive. So someone went out to the Tohono Odom and said, can you make us ceramic tortilla uh, griddles? And we found a number of these at the Tucson Presidio. We also find serving bowls uh, where you could put all your uh, soups and stews in and uh, carry it to the table. And then one of the things they did every morning was have chocolate, hot chocolate. Um, there's a story of 1781, Father Garces and another priest were out in a vacation area near Yuma, and he had been the priest here in Tucson for a while. Then the, the Catholic Church sent him out to Yuma to convert the Native Americans there, and he'd always gotten along well with the Indians uh, here in Tucson, but he showed up out in uh, Yuma, and they did not take kindly to this bossy pair of Spanish priests. And so one morning, he is busy having his hot chocolate, and a group of his friendly uh, Native Americans came running in and said, people are coming to kill you. And his response was, oh, well, let me finish my hot chocolate. <laughs> and unfortunately, he waited too long, and uh, he ran out into the marsh, and they caught him, and he and the Spanish priest and a bunch of other Spaniards ended up being killed. So hot chocolate can be dangerous. Uh, this is a copper chocolatero pot. Um, in that Casas painting, you saw the woman with the, the I never say it, the Mololino stick that they froth it with. Well, again, copper uh, uh, chocolatero pots were difficult to get a hold of in Tucson, and so someone went out to the Tohono O'odham and asked them to make ceramic uh, versions. And this is a type of vessel that's not seen before. Uh, uh, it's only seen in the historic period. We found both adult and child-sized versions of this. One of the very curious things we find are pieces of pottery made up in the Hopi and Zuni Pueblos. Um, and these are black and white uh, uh, pottery vessels, very different from the redware vessels you see here in Tucson. We know in 1793, the commander of the Presidio, Jose Romero, went up to Zuni to visit them. And we think that they came back with a bunch of these pots. Probably the soldiers brought them back to give their wives as souvenirs. And we find these actually at all of the Native American sites here in southern Arizona from the historic period. These are some from uh, out, the one on the right is from the Tucson Mountains, and the one on the left is found near San Javier. So we know that there were uh, people going back and forth uh, among the Native American communities. Here's another Costas painting, and you can see uh, the, uh, on the rack there is Miolica vessels. Uh, Miolica was a type of uh, pottery that was ori originally made in Moorish Spain. They sent the potters over uh, to Mexico City and they started their own industry there. The blue and white versions are made to resemble either Chinese porcelain uh, 
or uh, French Delft ware, and those are very popular up to about 1800, and then after 1800 you see more of the polychrome vessels. Now, uh, we had some, these, these ceramics on display at an open house during uh, one of our digs at the Tucson Presidio, and we had a, a visitor from Saudi Arabia come, and he looked at that big shirt in the center, and he said uh, to the people that were manning it, that's the word Allah. And this is a story that some people believe and a lot of people don't. Um, so the, the thing about uh, Moorish Spain, it was under the control of Arabs, and you could not paint certain things on vessels. You couldn't paint human figures, you weren't supposed to paint animals, but you could put phrases and words from the Quran on vessels. And it's possible that this particular word uh, was brought over as a pattern, and the people there, uh, by the time it got to Mexico, had no idea that it was actually the word Allah. So I tested this. I sent this picture to people from Turkey, Oman, Algeria, and Tunisia, and Saudi Arabia, and said, is this a word? And all of them said, oh yeah, that's Allah. So is it true? I don't know. Makes a good story. Here is a really fat guy riding a small horse. <laughs> So um, occasionally out in the desert, I, I'll confess, we have not found any horse gear at the Tucson Presidio. We know that the soldiers had between six and seven horses each and that there were something like a thousand horses in the king's horse herd. But out in the desert, uh, well, first of all, um, this is a Spanish style uh, a stirrup that was used up until 1793 and then it was uh, declared illegal. Back, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago or so, we did a thing called the Coronado Roadshow with the Center for Desert, or Desert Archaeology. I think that's what it was called at that time. Uh, Gail Hartman, who was here, was on that. And we went around to two communities in eastern Arizona and two communities in western New Mexico looking for Spanish artifacts. And a guy uh, brought these in. I can't remember what town it was. These are the, the type of stirrups that were used by the Spaniards up until 1793 when they were banned because uh, you tended to, if you fell off your horse, your foot got really caught in there and you get dragged. But uh, throughout southern Arizona, we occasionally find horse gear out in the desert, just lying around, including horseshoes. This is a Spanish or Mexican bridle. The uh, collections at the Arizona State Museum and the Arizona Historical Society have numerous examples of this. What kind of clothing did they wear? Of course, cloth doesn't preserve very well. Um, we know that the soldiers wore this uh, leather vest called the cuera that has like 15 uh, layers of leather, could stop an arrow that was being fired at it. Uh, they also wore a hat. They had to get a, a new uniform every year. They had to buy it themselves. The only reason why I know, we know that there's a guardhouse in the Tucson Presidio was because a soldier gambled his pants away. And there's a document describing how he was put in the guardhouse because he had no pants. <laughs> and had to wait until he got enough money saved up from his monthly income to buy himself a new pair of pants. Um, we do know that they liked pretty things like buttons. These are buttons from the Terranate Presidio. There were excavations done there in the 1950s. And Terranate, because they left after five years in 1781, they left everything inside their houses. And in the 1950s, Charles de Peso did excavations and found lots of stuff lying on the floor. We occasionally find these sort of brass buttons here in Tucson, as well as fancy uh, clothing buckles that would have been used on their shoes and on other parts of their clothing. Down at Terranate, they also had a thimble and uh, lead uh, or lead uh, seals. These were used for taxation purposes. That particular one is from Germany. They were bringing cloth all the way over across the ocean and like all the other goods, shipped up here in either pack mules or freight wagons. Here we have a Casas painting showing a, a peddler with sewing goods. The uh, Tohono Adam would come up and bring their pottery and their other goods here to Tucson, and one of the things they would get in return were buttons, thread, needles, cloth, manufactured cloth. Um, it was uh, uh, up until uh, uh, the territorial period that was very common. Of course, then there's a San Javier mission south of Tucson. And uh, you have to think about what's amazing about that structure was that it was built by, with the Pima Indians and the Papago or the Tona Adam. Um, it's amazing to think that they could do that. They brought up artisans and architects from Mexico, but a lot of it was the Native Americans building the, the structure. 
There was another uh, mission at the base of A Mountain, the St. Augustine mission. And this is the uh, earliest photograph taken in 1874 from Leopoldo Carrillo's house, his backyard. And that this two-story structure was the convento. It was the uh, building that the uh, priests would come and stay in when they were visiting because they, they didn't have a resident priest for most of the years it was open. And uh, it was supposed to also be a vocational school to teach Native Americans things that the Spaniards valued, like pottery making, leather tanning, uh, some reading and writing for the boys. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you can see that the roof is missing in this photograph. Mr. Carrillo very nicely removed the roof to roof his house, and that rapidly caused the building to be destroyed. There was also a chapel in the um, uh, Presidio, and here we have a, a drawing done in June of 1860. By this time, the roof of the chapel was falling in, and so the priest is standing in the doorway, and most of the congregation is outside. And you can see there's Native Americans visiting. Uh, what's kind of nice is that the fact that there's three bells depicted in the picture. One of those bells is in the bell tower at San Javier, one is in the San Augustine Cathedral downtown, and one is in something Pope Pius X's church here in town. So all three bells are still here in the community. What's interesting is to think about all these things that were brought up from Mexico, statues and uh, jugs of wine. They would, uh, when they did mass, only the priest was allowed to drink the wine because it was so uh, rare. They brought it up in big ceramic uh, jugs or amphoras. And we occasionally find uh, religious artifacts. This is a dig that we did down in the parking lot of the Tucson Water Building in 2005. And once in a while, I like to get down in the dirt and dig. And of course, the moment I got into the unit and started digging up, popped that medal. And I go, hey, I found a religious medal. And there were some uh, very angry <laughs> responses from the people that were working in that unit. And then I said, oh, we should uh, screen this dirt to see if there's beads. And sure enough, we found 44 beads uh, made in Czechoslovakia or Venice. Uh, it's the heart of Jesus and Maria. There's a, a crucifix with uh, Mary and Mary Magdalene looking up at uh, the crucified Jesus on it. In terms of arms and ammunition, uh, most of the soldiers were trained to use uh, muskets or escopetas. And all of them carried lances. Uh, you can fire a musket between uh, one and three times a minute. So some of the soldiers carried lances. Uh, in, you know, as their people are reloading, they can use the lances to ward off people that they didn't want uh, to get too close. Uh, the uh, trigger guard that's visible there is a brown Bess trigger guard that's manufactured in England. After uh, Mexico became independent from Spain in 1821. Spain immediately said, we're not selling you any uh, arms or ammunition. So the Mexican government said, hmm, who would sell us arms and ammunition? Well, Great Britain hates Spain with a passion. So let's go to them. And they, sure enough, they bought brown best muskets. And there was always a, people wondering whether they actually showed up in Tucson. And we found this one at the Francisco Solano Leon house. And another one was found in the well at the Carrillo house at the mission site. And then uh, the next to it is the, a ramrod holder. That is the only other uh, piece of, of firearm that I have found on one of my digs. Because they were so valuable, the metal, if you broke your gun, it was taken immediately to the blacksmith for reuse. We also can see a, a, a gun flint in this picture. And uh, gun flints were originally manufactured in France. When it became difficult to get them, they actually made them from a local stone found in the Santa Cruz River flood uh, plain. Down at Terranate, we they found uh, stock ornaments uh, used to decorate parts of the uh, uh, firearm back in the 1950s. And then on our uh, uh, Coronado Roadshow, somebody brought in this escopeta and his uh, he said that his father's worker in the 1940s had found it stuffed in a cliff, uh, crack in a cliff face. And uh, it was in immaculate condition. It had the original uh, flint still held in place by a piece of leather. You could see the oil staining on the stock uh, from whoever had handled it last. And you can see the beautiful decorations. And these are the type of things that were probably here in Tucson. As well, we find lots of Piman points in Tucson. The Pima were uh, allies with the soldiers. Uh, 
uh, uh, at the Presidio and would occasionally go out on uh, expeditions with them. These are about uh, an inch and a quarter. They would have been mounted on a small um, uh, fore shaft and attached to a longer arrow shaft. Uh, Desert Archaeology has a bl weekly blog. And if you go to desert.com, you can look at it. And um, Myself and other people in the company write articles, and we re recently wrote one on this particular topic, and we have pictures of a group of arrows that were donated to Desert Archaeology, found in a cave site. We're still uh, uh, with bits of leather still wound around them and some of the fore shafts. And then we have uh, the, the gun flints from uh, France and from local ones. As they wore down, they were converted to strike lights and you could use them to, uh, if you got up in the morning and your fire had gone out, you'd take that and you'd hit it with a piece of metal, it makes a spark, you get it going into a bit of straw and you can start your fire again. Perhaps the most luxurious item you find in the Tucson Presidio was Chinese porcelain. And this was made somewhere in the Hong Kong area, shipped to the Philippines, then brought on Spanish galleons from the Philippines to the west coast of Mexico, usually Veracruz, shipped up to Wymus, and then brought up in pack wagons or pack trains to Tucson. And only the, probably the fort commander and the other officers could afford uh, these sort of uh, fancy vessels. And so we don't find very many of them. During the, the course of the Mexican period from 1821 to 1856, the, with the new trade route open uh, with England, all of a sudden these new vessels could arrive in the Tucson Presidio. And these were found at the Leon House down close to I-10 uh, north of Congress. They lived there in the 1840s. These transfer printed ceramics have scenes on them. On this particular set, there's a cathedral, a group of men fishing, and a forest scene. And you have to think the people living here in Tucson had no access to any sort of uh, media. They, of course, didn't have television or the internet, but they also didn't have newspapers. They didn't have books with pictures in them. So they really didn't have any idea of what the outside world is. And you can think of Mrs. Leon, Ramona Leon, sitting there with her friends drinking hot chocolate in the morning and looking at these pictures on these cups and getting a glimpse of the outside world thousands of miles away. If you were a woman living in the Tucson Presidio, it's very unlikely that you ever went any farther than San Javier. Um, you probably never actually went down into Sonora. It was, it was too dangerous and uh, you had too many other opportunities, things you had to take care of like all of your kids. And so you had a very limited life and just this little luxury item would, would have brought some joy to those women. They did not have fancy kitchens like this, of course, but this shows what sort of the upper class uh, people would do down in Mexico. And you can see a, a woman with her mano and matate grinding. Uh, there have been excavations of skeletons in the Tucson Presidio Cemetery back in the 1960s. And uh, these were recently actually reburied out at Holy Hope Cemetery. But before they were reburied, they were analyzed by osteologists from the University of Arizona. And one of the things they noticed was that all of the older women had a lot of arthritis in their shoulders. And that was likely because they would sit there every morning and grind up corn or wheat on their manos and matates to make flowers for the morning tortillas. So uh, what do we know based on all my work? Well, they relied on local resources as much as possible. It was very difficult to get things here because of the long distance over land um, and the fact that people were pretty poor. You got a monthly salary for being a soldier, and there were about 100 soldiers who they could support their families. But everything was so expensive, the commander had the, for, uh, the store, of course, and so the soldiers had to go to the commander's store to buy stuff. And so we have a list of accounts, and almost all the soldiers were heavily in debt. So you had to make do with what you could get locally. So that meant trading a, a button or two for a pot to cook your supper in, um, and that sort of thing. But there were certain imported things that were very important. Those Miolica dishes that I showed you, if you were a, a Mexican woman living here in the Tucson Presidio, that's what you served your food on. You didn't serve it on Native American pottery because your mother and your grandmother and your aunts all had used this type of Miolica pottery to serve the stews and soups and other things. And that was very important culturally as a way to maintain their uh, Spanish and Mexican culture. And again, recycling was very, very important. 
uh, for the trade. Uh, lots of trade with Native Americans. They were the Tohono Adam got along really well with the Spanish. There's literally no uh, stories of conflict between the two during the years, the 80 years that Tucson Presidio was in existence. There was the long distance thing where they go up north to Zuni and come back with souvenirs, just like today when we go to places, we come back with something to remind us. The items that came from central Mexico included a Mayolica pottery, uh, ammunition, uh, some uh, metal, uh, like metal ingots, cloth and clothing, chocolate, chocolate, everyone had chocolate. And long distance often have the most culturally significant items. Those are the things like the uh, statues that were made for the churches, the uh, uh, fancy uh, Chinese porcelains, silk outfits for the wives of the commander, certain foods, spices, rice, things that you, that you could not obtain in the Sonoran Desert. And all this trade allowed the people living here in the Tucson Presidio to maintain their traditional culture that they had back in Mexico. And the, the, the amazing thing was oftentimes the soldiers retired, they stayed here in Tucson, they didn't leave because they were accustomed to what life was like. And that's why we have so many descendants from the Tucson Presidio here today. And again, my plug, uh, come on the Saturday, not this Saturday, the next one, 10 to four down the Tucson Presidio. And you can see what's going on. Uh, well, I have a number of my volunteers here in the audience um, and you have a good time. That's my talk. Homer, you're amazing. A, a, a quarter of a century of passion invested in the local archeology span and uh, it all sort of condensed there into a 35 minute little talk. Thank you, Homer. You're welcome. Um, questions, I'll repeat the question and uh, Homer's, yes. So where did the chocolate come from? So chocolate is a, a species that's uh, native to Central America. They would harvest it there, uh, process it into big slabs of dried chocolate and uh, wrap it up in some sort of cloth and bring it up north. And then they would take that and, and pound a little bit every morning. We don't actually have a recipe from the Tucson Presidio, so we don't know if they drank it, you know, uh, without sugar or with sugar or with other spices. We just don't know. But we do know that they were enjoying it here because we have uh, accounts from stores in Mexico saying, oh, we're shipping it to Tucson. So in this era, what was the potential uh, sources of sugar? So the Spanish controlled the most of the places in the Caribbean. And they, of course, they had sugar plantations there uh, where the uh, unfortunate African-American slaves were busy making uh, sugar. They would ship it to Mexico City and then they would ship some of it up north. People living here in the Tucson Presidio could also, if they happened to come upon uh, native honey, that could be used. But uh, they didn't have a lot of sugar. The, the teeth of the people that were buried in the Tucson Presidio, virtually no cavities. Uh, they're worn down from the grit from the Manos Matates, but their teeth are in great shape. How did the individual soldier uh, deal with the debt that they might have carried with the uh, store, with the... Uh... Well, I, I'm assuming that they, they died without paying it off, probably. <laughs> The average lifespan of a man, uh, if, you, if you survive childhood, uh, women tend to live into the upper 40s, early 50s, men into their uh, mid to late 50s. Women died earlier because they had more stress from childbirth and breastfeeding. Um, there were lots of epidemics that came through that uh, wiped out the Native American communities largely around the Presidio, but even within the Presidio, uh, uh, in 1851, 125 of the 600 residents living in Tucson died during either a measles or smallpox epidemic. So I'm assuming a lot of them died without paying it off. So how did, how did exchange work? If, if things are coming in from these distant places, what is the local uh, medium of exchange that makes that possible? So the soldiers' rosters we have list how much money the soldiers are getting each month, as well as some of them are getting bonuses. Uh, 
Uh, if you were an invalid soldier, uh, had been hurt during a raid or something, you were uh, given a pension. And so you would accumulate money every month, and that's what you used. And that's why basically every single young adult male that was born in Tucson by the 1790s were enlisting in the military. So if you enlisted in the military, you enlisted for 10 years. Uh, we have uh, quite a few of the enlistment records I, I sent away to the military archives in Simancas, Spain, and they very nicely uh, sent me copies of all these enlistment records. They provide a description of each of the soldiers, and the vast majority of them signed with an X because they could not read or write. Um, and then after 10 years, if you were a soldier, you were allowed to go on a vacation. You could take two or three months off and go visit relatives down in Sonora if you wanted to. And then most of them would re-enlist for another 10 years because that, again, that was the only way to get money. So speaking of money, have you found coins or any kind of uh, direct evidence of, of that? I, we found a, a, what we call a piece of eight. It's a silver coin that was cut into a, uh, an eighth uh, as for change, when the, because they didn't have smaller coins for change. Uh, it was rubbed so, so that you can actually see what year it was. Um, and that was the only coin I've ever found. Poor Homer. Well, I found coins at territorial sites. So, so where did these military people come from? Were, were they locally out of Mexico or... Um, all the way across from, from Europe and Spain. So I think um, of all the soldiers that were in Tucson, only a handful were from Spain, and there might have been one Italian, I think. The rest of them were born down in Sonora or Chihuahua, Sinaloa. And then by the uh, late 18 or 1790s, most of them were born here in the local area. Um, I, one of the things I did as part of this research was to research every single individual born in Tucson prior to 1856. And uh, if you come to the Presidio, you can see the very fat volume uh, that's for sale. There's an earlier version somewhere on the Archaeology Southwest website. I don't exactly know where the address is, but um, if you buy it at our Presidio gift shop, you help support our mission. Yeah. He knows about money. Yeah. So, yeah, elaborate on a little more of the history of Hugo O'Connor and how he related to the, uh, as an Irishman, uh, to these Spanish um, military and, and so on. All right, so um, uh, Ireland was being treated very poorly by England at this time period. And there were lots of second and third sons in, in somewhat wealthy families who had no opportunities in, in Ireland because the English overlords were, you know, not very nice to them. So a lot of them packed up their bags and went to the continent, and a lot of them joined up to the Spanish military. And they weren't actually mercenaries, they were enlisted in the Spanish military. Hugo O'Connor was shipped across to Mexico, um, and it's been years since I've actually read, there's a book called The Red Captain that describes him. He had red hair. And uh, he moved up the ranks. Uh, I, think, I think eventually he was a lieutenant colonel in the military, and he impressed a lot of people, so they sent him on this fact-finding mission in 1775 to travel from Louisiana to uh, California. Um, and he had enough power that he could say, this is going to be where the Tucson Presidio is, and the following year they came up and started building it. Um, eventually he retired back into Mexico, and I can't remember how long he lived, but he had a nice long life, married a, a, a woman there and had kids. And uh, if you go to the public library downtown up on the second or third floor, there's actually a painting of him that's on display. So Homer, does that ring a bell with you the, at the curve on Fort Lowell? Yes, that, that cemetery was started either in the 1870s or 1880s by the uh, Mexican families that were living it, at Fort Lowell, it might have been even a little bit later because after Fort Lowell was uh, officially abandoned in uh, 1891, uh, a number of Mexican families moved into the buildings. Aha, uh -huh. when were, when, what were the last above ground remnants of the, of the Presidio here in Tucson? In 1918, uh, they tore down the last existing wall section and uh, there might be a photo of it in that earlier Archaeology in Tucson uh, magazine. And at the time, there was an editorial in the newspaper saying, maybe we should have saved this. Um, and that was uh, very close to where we found it in the Pima County Courthouse Courtyard. 
1929, when they built that domed courthouse, they found a number of adobe bricks uh, from the uh, wall. If you, if you go to our desert.com blog, you'll find an interesting story about the city engineer, uh, Donald Page, who uh, salvaged some of the bricks, and they are currently, as far as I know, still on display inside the courthouse, and maybe will still be there when they put the new museums in. And Donald Page, let me say he was a horrible person. And if you read my blog article, you'll find out why. It's, it is worth reading. He was horrible. So the question, uh, Kanoa Ranch is a Pima County preserve uh, down south of town. And exhibits there mentioned the uh, De Anza expedition. And I, I will admit to not knowing a huge amount about the De Anza expedition. But I believe Mr. De Anza uh, was the token first commander of the Tucson Presidio. And he would have come up through here. And I'm not sure if the fort, it was, it was 18, 1775 or 77, I can't remember. 75, well, that was before the fort existed. So, um, yeah. So the question is, uh, what about the incoming uh, migration from China and Chinese folks here in this region? Well, if you go to desert.com vlog, there's an article about the early Chinese in Tucson, which I wrote. Um, the Chinese started showing up either in 1874 or 1875. The first few opened uh, American food style restaurants here in Tucson. There were about 25 in 1879. In 1880, the Southern Pacific Railroad was built from Yuma to El Paso and uh, 125 or so of the Chinese men building the railroads stopped off and stayed in Tucson. And they operated uh, stores, restaurants. They were produce farmers out at the Mission of San Augustine. Some of them worked as servants. And, uh, and by, I think, 1900, there were about 400 Chinese here in town. Very difficult time for them because of the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 prevented those men from bringing their wives and children over from China. And uh, the same sort of immigration things that are going on today, we're going back on at that time period. How did Tucson enter into the United States from being um, south of the border in uh, with the Gadsden Purchase and uh -huh. that transition process? So uh, the Gadsden Purchase took place in 1853 when uh, the Mexican government sold what's now Arizona from the Gila River south to the border. They had laid out the border in 1852. John Russell Bartlett came across and there's actually a famous drawing and painting that he did uh, from A Mountain looking at uh, the Presidio and the mission. Uh, but the American government wasn't in a big rush to occupy this area. So it wasn't until March of 1856 that the Mexican government decided to withdraw. They marched out with their wagon loads of soon to be cigarettes and cigars of paper records. Some of the soldiers that went south eventually came back and lived here, including the Leon family. Um, I don't think the American military showed up until later that year, um, towards the fall of 1856. So archaeology tells some story, but are there other documents, uh, written records that might uh, that you've used or that you're aware of that elaborate on that further? So um, we actually have no records describing life in the Presidio. We have a few store accounts to tell us some of the things that were brought in. But starting in the 1870s, you get people, uh, Anglos, European Americans, recording the memories of people that lived here in Tucson. And up until the 19, early 1930s, there are a number of accounts that were preserved by people that were living in the Tucson, either as adults or, or people that were born here as children. Um, Sam Hughes's wife, Atanasia Santa Cruz, is one of those people. There's a, a, a a couple of different books where she was interviewed and re re wrote her recollections of the life here in the Tucson Presidio. So the Casa Cordoba uh, is immediately north of the Museum of Art. Um, is uh, What is the status of that building? I, I think uh, that building was, it's in, in fact, inside the Presidio. The boundaries of the Presidio are Main Street on the west, Washington Street on the north, Church Avenue on the east, and Pennington Street on the south. So it was about 700 feet to a side. The Casa Cordova was tree ring dated sometime, I think, in the late 1840s or 1850s, and is believed to be the oldest or second oldest standing structure in Tucson.
So the Old Town Artisans Complex there, um, the La Cocina restaurant and so on, um, that would be immediately inside the, the, the uh, Presidio wall, right? Yes, it's inside the, the Presidio. The st structures that are standing today are, were built in the 1870s. Uh, a merchant named Goldberg uh, had a warehouse there. He was a liquor salesman, among other things. Uh, it, it wasn't really a fortress, but it did have what they call a zaguan, where you could drive your horse and carriage or your buggies through, and he would unload his uh, merchandise in the courtyard where the restaurant patio is. Is there a story with the well, steamboat on the Santa Cruz? There is. There was a guy named Mr. Reynolds who came here in the 1790s, and he uh, is well known because he had a one of the early... Uh, sort of Kodak type cameras, and he went around and took pictures, including some of the best pictures of the uh, convento structure at the San Agustin Mission were taken by him. And he was told that the steamboat would arrive there on schedule and that he could go and take the steamboat south. Um, and so he went over there and waited and waited and waited, and finally someone came up and told him, there is no steamboat ever. <laughs> Because the Santa Cruz River uh, never flowed uh, year-round above ground. It, it flowed above ground in certain spots and then would disappear underground. And uh, for instance, it flowed at San Javier and then went underground. And then around 22nd Street or so, it popped up. Uh, there's a basalt ridge that runs down from A Mountain that forces the water up at that location. It ran north for a couple of miles and then again sunk underground. So yeah, there was never a steamboat, unfortunately. So don't invest in steamboat tickets. Yeah. We know there were horses. Um, not much is e emerging from the archeological record, but uh, what kind of uh, targets were they for the Apaches? So the Apaches often, uh, in the 80 years that the fort was in existence, there were about 80 raids. And it was a back and forth thing. The Spanish would go up into the Apache villages in the mountains, kill everybody and kidnap their kids. The Apaches would come down to Tucson or other areas and kidnap kids and women and take them. And uh, on their raids, they would uh, capture cattle mostly. They also would capture horses and mules, but they didn't actually ride them. Uh, they would take them up into the mountains and butcher them. And that was the case up until at least the 1860s. The Apaches preferred to uh, walk on foot because it was, uh, well, you, first of all, you didn't have to feed the dumb horse. I mean, if you ate it, it was much easier. And, um, and it was, horses uh, have a bigger signature. So there was a soldier sitting up on the top of Sentinel Peak every day. And one of the things he was doing was looking for the clouds of dust from Apache warriors as they were walking down through the desert. If you have a horse, it's going to make a much more visible cloud of dust. If you're on foot, you can, uh, and it's also quieter. If you're on foot, you don't have some horse or mule making noise. So uh, up until probably the 1860s, they were just mainly used for meat. One more. So what about other crops um, here produced locally that, to feed the local populace? So uh, we take samples of the soil and float, uh, float them in water and collect the charred seeds. And from that, uh, the most common uh, food crop that we find is wheat. And wheat was a high status food. It was a non-Native American food. So uh, the, if you had a choice between a, a flour tortilla and a corn flour tortilla, you'd always want the wheat flour tortilla. We also... Uh, uh, know that they were uh, out at the mission site. There was orchards with quince, was the most commonly mentioned fruit, but also peaches. Um, recently, we did a I did the field school with uh, at the University of Arizona down at the Guavavi mission site, and two of the things that we found were the oldest known peach pits in Arizona, and at the time also the oldest known uh, chili pepper seed. Um, and since then, they have actually found uh, an earlier one up in the Phoenix area dating to the proto-historic period prior to uh, the 1690s. So, um, and if you go to desert.com blog, there's a thing on a uh, Spanish period diet here in Tucson where uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some of the food they ate. So, Homer, you, you teased me because you showed a picture of a cat. What's the oldest known cat in the archaeological record here in Tucson. We, uh, I believe we had a, a cat bone at the Mission of San Augustine from a mission period deposit somewhere between 1800 and 1820. 
And nearby in the Chinese gardener's well, we found butchered cats and kittens with cleaver marks across the top of their skulls and little chop marks. So they were uh, being enjoyed. On that note. <laughs> Thank you for coming.